Okay, it looks like everything is kind of leveling off here. So let's go ahead and get started. Um, before I introduce Sarah, let's do it. Let me um, make a few announcements. I'm Dottie Head. I'm the Director of Communications for Georgia Audubon, and we are delighted to be here this evening and to introduce Sarah Rakowski. Um, I actually met her on a Facebook group called World Girl Birders, and she was looking for a forum to um, present her research. And since we've been all in the digital realm since since COVID started, I was happy to um, have a have an opportunity to host her tonight. Um, before we get before I introduce Sarah, let me make a few announcements. Our Georgia Bird Fest kicks off the weekend of April 17th and 18th with more than 40 bird and nature themed trips, webinars, and workshops. As soon as I get done with the introductions, I'll post a link in the chat box. Um, there are still some great a lot, of the play, a lot of the trips are filled, but there's still some great spaces available in some of our workshops, including beginning and advanced photography and um, many of our webinars and our keynote speaker to kick off the opening weekend with Scott Widensall. On March the 30th, we're going to be hosting a second Birding by Ear workshop with ornithologist Georgian Schmals. Um, the, it's going to be a webinar and it will take place from 7 to 8 p.m. And you can uh, find the registration link on our digital resources page, which I will also post on our um, post in the chat box. Um, finally, if you're not already a member of Georgia Audubon and you're in the area, we'd always love to welcome you to our membership to take advantage of early registration and discounted um, registrations for our trips and workshops and webinars and all the things we're offering um, through COVID and even now. Without further ado, I'm going to introduce you to Sarah Rakowski. Sarah is a high school student from Princeton, New Jersey, and has been interested in birds and nature for as long as she can remember. She began bird watching in elementary school and ever since has been fascinated by birds and their environments. Preparation for her research on feral pigeons began in her first year of high school and carried through to her senior year. The study of microevolution and regional variation of feral pigeons took her from Maine to Florida to collect data. With her results identified in her paper written, this research is slated for publication by 2022. Aside from the hard science of avian study, Sarah also has an interest in nature and art and, and literature, as well as the philosophy of science. Irby Lovett, a noted ornithologist at the Cornell Lab of Ornithology, has been one of her mentors in this fascinating study. And Sarah was recently profiled in an eBird story on young ornithologists. Uh, we were just chatting before um, we had started the webinar, and Sarah let me know that she has been accepted to the Cornell University, where she will be studying there in the fall. So that um, is not unexpected, but very exciting news. Um, and finally, before when I turn it over to Sarah, if you have any questions, please ask them in the chat or in Q&A box. Um, we will let her get through her presentation and then have questions and answers at the end of her talk. So um, without further ado, Sarah, I will turn it over to you. All righty. Hi. Hello there. Oh, come on. Are we having time? Oh, there we go. So again, most of uh, rehash of what Dottie just said. Uh, hi, I'm Sarah Rakowski from New, New Jersey in my senior year of high school. Um, I've been interested in birds, especially pigeons, for as long as I can remember, and have been a recreational bird watcher since elementary school. I first became interested in evolution, and especially its micro subset, after learning about the work of Peter and Rosemary Grant with the Galapagos Finches of Daphne Major, which, if you haven't heard of it, is absolutely incredible work in which the scientists on an island in the Pacific watched a new species of finch evolve in real time. It is incredible and I highly suggest you check it out. My project officially started in 2018, my sophomore year, and has since been ongoing. This project was done in conjunction with a three-year class in my high school based around the process of teaching research. Part one. The familiar and often forlorn, rock pigeon of modern power lines, gutters, and rooftops, is native to Eurasia, where, in their wild state, they nest on crags and cliffs and feed on wild grains. In the wild, rock pigeons have diversified into 12 subspecies. But around 10,000 years ago, in the Fertile Crescent, humans began to notice these birds and brought a few of them into captivity. 
Well, I don't know exactly why the first person decided to catch a pigeon and keep it. Archaeological records suggest that birds that these pigeons were kept as meat producers, religious icons, and ornamental birds. At this point, we start to see evidence of classical domestication, defined as modifications in, in an animal's biology produced by humans. This is most evident in an early Egyptian tomb painting showing a wild type rock pigeon next to a, a domestic red moth. As time progressed and humans and pigeons spent more of that time together, pigeons gained popularity as meat producers and ornamental birds, but they found a new use as a messenger and therefore were carried by humans wherever they went. Spreading throughout the world and across cultures, pigeons diversified even further into distinct domestic breeds. These diversifications can be split into about four basic types, with most breeds having a mix of the four. Morphological variation or change in physical structure represents birds like the hawk or the hawk and the phantom. The bodies of these birds have been so intensely modified with the tail of the fantail and the eye and bill of the barb, they've lost almost all resemblance to the wild type rock pigeon. Physiologically, or in regard to physical function, we have breeds like the Stargrad Shaker, whose muscles make their heads quiver rather than bob like a wild type pigeon. It is an incredibly unsettling thing to see, and I do not know who thought that would be a good idea to breed that bird into existence, but it exists. <laughs> Much less unsettlingly, we have the Tipler Pigeon, which has been known to fly for 21 plus hours straight. Behaviorally modified birds, we have the horseman powder, known for its stunning aerial courtship displays in contrast to the wild type pigeon's ground-based courtship displays and the ability to lure hens back to its roost. And we cannot forget, of course, the aerial cartwheeling of the Birmingham roller. Color-wise, we have pigeons like the satinette and starling, which may look like a wild type pigeon in silhouette, but their coloration is wildly different. And on coloration, even in feral birds that have since left humans long behind, they, there is still an incredible diversity of color unmatched by almost any other wild bird species. In a single city flock, you can see white birds, red birds, brown birds, black birds, gray birds. Which makes one think, we'll get to that. Of course, as pigeons spread across the world, they reach the shores of North America and spread either as free flying birds, as ferals, or as birds housed in open dovecotes like this, like this example from South Carolina, from Nova Scotia to Florida. Based on folk art depictions, birds were popular in England and France, as well as those present on the North American continent. We can be relatively sure that the vast majority of rock pigeons colonized in North America were of a common dovecote flying breed, likely akin to the modern racing homer, a rather plain looking pigeon. This brings me to the start of my research question. What happens when we have a bird and we know it has the capacity for absolutely stunning diversity? We place it in a new, rather variable environment where it colonizes. Well, we know what happens. This is the story of the Galapagos finches, which are actually tanagers, but we know that they colonize these islands and then over many, many generations adapted to suit their different environments. So if something like that can happen in Galapagos finches, could it happen in pigeons? This brings me to my official research question. Since their introduction to North America, have populations of rock pigeons physically diverged from one another? To answer my question, I first outlined pigeon populations using occurrence data from eBird, a citizen science website, then traveled to the places inhabited by these populations. I ended up traveling from Maine to Florida and also out to Chicago, where I trapped live feral individuals and access museum specimens. With these live and preserved specimens, I took measurements of their beak length, beak depth, head length, wing length, tail length, leg feathering, leg length, and weight. Photographs from citizen science platforms, again, like eBird, but also another one called iNaturalist, were used to identify individuals with a long grouse phenom with this sort of blue looking plumage on their legs. Of course, to take measurements of the pigeon, you need to get that pigeon into your hands. That's pretty easy when you're working with preserved specimens in the museum. They're dead. They can't run away from you. It's a little harder with feral birds who would rather not be held today. So for the difficult task of getting pigeon from sidewalk to pigeon to me, I employed four methods, one of which was 
chasing after the birds with a net like a mad woman, which actually worked once. <laughs> Using a snare on a perch, again, it worked, but only once. And the two more successful methods. One of them was a type of cage trap, which was called the walk-in. This one was operated by Wiley Coyote style, making a trail of bird seed to go in and pigeons would come in, eat the seed and find themselves caught. Pigeons are pretty clever though, and they figured this one out, which is why they had to move to a more sophisticated method usually used for birds of prey. This is a bone net. It's remotely triggered. I am hiding during this video. The net lays flush across the ground at to a baited site, and then once birds are in range, I hit a button and the net flings forward. So, of course, trapping pigeons is very interesting. Museum collections can be a lot more reliable, and I need to fill in gaps in my data. So, in many cases, birds that have been hit by cars have flown into windows have been collected on scientific expeditions or have otherwise died around humans, are deposited in museum specimens and museum collections for preservation and study. These specimens are always tagged with the date and location of collection, which made them very useful for my research. And despite the strangeness and the eeriness of being surrounded by hundreds of thousands of bird skins with cotton white eyes and boxes of skeletons and jars of pickled who knows what, Museum collections of preserved birds have an enchanting beauty, and I may recommend if you ever have the chance to go behind the scenes at a museum, you should definitely take that opportunity. It is absolutely ethereal and beautiful and hard to put into words. So, but of course, what did all of this pigeon prodding get me? Well, I found that northern pigeons, found in regions one and two, had a greater body mass by 24 grams, about the mass of an American goldfinch. Other than having extra songbirds worth of mass, northern pigeons also had longer leg feathering and a higher rate of that boot, that boot like long grass phenotype. Central pigeons, found in region three, had a lesser tail length, and southern pigeons, found in region four, had a lesser head length but greater bill length. So, what could this mean? So pigeons in the northern region are likely following what's called Bergman's rule of body size. Bergman's rule is not a law or a real rule, but more of a trend in biology that within a broadly distributed taxonomic group, populations or species of larger size are found in cooler environments, while populations or species of smaller size are found in warmer regions. This is often attributed to larger animals being better at conserving heat than smaller ones. This is exhibited extremely well in the North American falcons, the largest of our falcons, the jeer falcon, being found exclusively in northern regions, the smaller prairie falcon being found centrally, and the teeny tiny alpamato falcon being found further south. The greater fed leg feathering of northern pigeons is also likely a method of heat conservation. Pigeons are known to use their legs like radiators to cool themselves in the heat, but having a radiator when you're trying to keep warm isn't the best. So to prevent from losing heat, northern pigeons are sort of throwing a blanket on top of their radiators. Birds with shorter tails, such as central pigeons, are known to have a faster directional flight speed than those with longer tails due to a reduction in drag. Faster directional speed is known to help in the escape from speed hunting aerial predators, such as the peregrine falcon, which are much more numerous in region three than other regions sampled. It also needs to be noted that a reduction in drag also means a reduction in maneuverability. We do not really know yet how this might affect these birds. The difference of bill length and head length of southern birds varied from the northern populations by only about a millimeter, if this measurement was not an error, although all of my mathematics tells me that the result was legitimate. It is likely from an effect such as genetic drift, which is a very random evolutionary process, or for a selection pressure that is as of yet unknown to me. So, since their introduction to and colonization of Eastern North America, rock pigeons have diverged from one another into their separate environments, most notably in tail length, leg feathering, and body weight. Because of this, some microevolution most likely has occurred 
may be portraying a greater reality of how introduced species respond to their new environments. But what will happen in the future? If these pigeons continue to diverge in their sort of urban islands, if you will, will they eventually end up as separate species like the Galapagos finches? I mean, if humanity hasn't wiped itself out in a few hundred years, could we in our future field guides have different species of pigeons on our, on our color plates? Imagine, imagine the, the booted pigeon found in the Northern US and Southern Canada, I told apart from other pigeon subspecies by its large body size and its feathery legs. And then the much smaller, the lesser range of the bobtailed pigeon found from New York City to Baltimore in a sort of delicate evolutionary dance with its predators, the peregrine falcons that have since become nearly endemic to the region. And then of course the cryptic, lesser pigeon found in the north in the southern United States with its long pointy bill and its rather petite body size. Okay, maybe I'm getting a bit ahead of myself here, but <laughs> guys, we are watching evolution occur from our kitchen windows, on the street, in our parks. These birds are not static and just like every organism we know, they're evolving and we can watch it and with these pigeons especially, we can see it right before our very eyes. We can measure it with tools. Isn't that incredible? Part two. One question I get asked a lot in research is the rather banal. So why is your work important? Now, I can usually come up with a few good things on the fly about understanding invasive species for conservation, or more precisely, extermination, or perhaps more enticingly, about how endangered species might be able to adapt to human altered landscapes. And while those are good enough applications for these things that I found, they aren't why I set out in the first place. But then that begs the question, why did I set out in the first place? As a member of a class at my high school with a few other researching students, something always felt wrong while I was abandoning everything else to lay traps in a pasture. My closest friends were researching incredible things like the metabolic pathways in a little worm called C. elegans. And this, the, this pathway in this little worm could help us understand how Alzheimer's disease progresses in humans. And another one of my friends was studying the effectiveness of public health officers in West Africa by just crunching raw data. And yet another was working on the progress of chytrid fungal disease in Northern salamanders and all of these incredible things and possibly saving lives and species. But then there I was, weighing pigeons. It might seem a little histrionic to say that. And don't get me wrong, I'm happy to be doing research at all, but why like this? Practice, maybe, but couldn't I get practice with less of this idleness? I mean, messing up on a pigeon is less of a big deal than messing up on a red copy of woodpecker, but it's still weird to be using up time and money and resources on, on pigeons. It, it really bugged me for a while. Um, the question of why was my research important became changed to was my research important? It really seemed that it didn't. It seemed to have no purpose, no end goal, other than, than to perhaps reach into a thicket and pick up a handful of dried and twisted laurels and throw them into my rather dirty and tangled hair. I was thinking about this over the summer, and as I sat down to write the manuscript that, with luck, will be published soon, what good was this sort of academic study for the sake of study? I spent the summer writing, but I also spent it reading. And as it turns out, this is something that has terrified, unsettled, and distressed almost everyone who has done this kind of thing. I was going through some old notes on my computer 
And something that really struck me was this line. Sapere aude, it's Latin. I don't remember exactly in what context I first heard this phrase. I found it in my notes about the enlightenment from, what was it, ninth grade? <laughs> apparently it was something that all the old French nerds liked to shout. And apparently it was also a favorite of Immanuel Kant, who is not a favorite of mine, but that's beside the point. But in that virtual pile of notes, I recorded something else. The most common translation of Sapere Aude is to dare to know. And like most things, it sounds much cooler in Latin. But there's a lot more there. And on these words, I found something, a sentiment, hanging off of them like the gossamer tail of a kite. Yes, it was sort of translucent and a little bit stringy, but it was, it was definitely there. Something along the lines of just having the courage, courage being the operant word, to just learn for the sake of learning, to just, just go, to dive into the blackest sea of ink, as deep and lonesome as it might be, to unmoor yourself to that one unknown. There is somehow worth fighting and living and dying for. Go on, go on a wild hunt, crashing through the sky as the valent Slepnir, the white-winged Pegasus, with the fury of the Thunderbird's mantle. Go into that wide night sky. And perhaps, if you will, you will write some of it down for us. And that's, that's why I do it. I can't put it into prose. There's a failure in our language to be able to capture something like that gossamer kite tail. It's there, but I can't write it. And hey, it's lofty and it's abstract, but it's there. And we know on some deep level that we need it. We dare, we know, and we hold our fingers to the pulse of life and feel how it moves and how it breathes. And that's it. And okay, maybe that was a bit intense and perhaps pretentious on my part, but that's my story and I'm sticking with it. But of course, this is a three-part story after all. So to the blooper reel. <laughs> oh dear. So my mom, was acting as my most, face, my, my most faithful field assistant. Almost got run down by a van in Key West, <laughs> perhaps due to a failure of communications on my part. <laughs> I might have made the man with the van, the angry man in the parking lot. Um, I will not be repeating that mistake. Um, <laughs> permits. You need permits to work with wildlife, even invasive species, especially invasive species if you're working in Florida. Sometimes you can't get permits for whatever reason. Like in Virginia, I would have been required to kill the pigeons after capture, which I was in no way willing to do. In New York, I was, by some mystical bureaucratic process, my permit never came back to me. Um, and then in Georgia, the legalities of it were just an absolute mess. So there was no trapping anywhere in those three states. And tragically, New York was the biggest blow to me. And the dream of sitting in Central Park catching pigeons never did come true. Boston. Boston was a problem in general. It was cold. Well, of course, cold is Boston. But some people were a little too curious. Now, don't get me wrong. I am all for the curiosity of the bystander. But you see, they weren't just curious about my work. They were also curious about me. A little too much. So that got very weird very fast. We also had the most open hostility to research of anywhere that we did our trapping. 
Um, we had the most times that the police were called on us. We had, you know, people shouting at us, telling us to pull up the traps because it was what we were doing was very stupid. And of course, the pigeons themselves refused to cooperate. They were very shy in Boston and trapping there was far less successful than our other sites. Equipment. Scares and malfunctions. <laughs> Working with new equipment and old equipment in extreme and sometimes normal conditions. Like, did you know that a the average digital kitchen scale begins to melt at air temperatures above 105 degrees? I sure didn't until I was weighing pigeons in the summer in the parking lot in Key West. <laughs> My big, expensive, precious bonnet got run over by an ATV, which gave me a heart attack, but it survived which was great, but of course, equipment always breaks, overheats, freezes, dies, and gets submerged when you least expect it. And of course, there were trap fails. <laughs> Sometimes we get bycatch in bird trapping. Sometimes our bycatch is incredibly weird. In Key West, we didn't just get fly to birds. We got chickens in our traps. We got iguanas in our traps. And then especially in South Carolina, we had this little fellow, the boat-tailed grackle. They do not like being touched. That includes being released. So getting them out of the net often requires cutting the net open, and they love to get themselves tangled up in nets. I love them. They're a really cool bird. They're USA endemic. They're a salt marsh breeder. I just, they've learned that they are more dangerous when they use their beaks to stab rather than bite. It's okay. Still love them. They're purple. <laughs> but geez, guys, you can, you can tone it down a little bit. <laughs> Sometimes I'm trapping among other animals that I need to worry about. Pigeons love to spend time on farms and are often known to become a bold and accustomed to humans when living above among farm animals and their caretakers. So I was spending time tra setting traps among sheep and goats and cattle and not pigs, I don't mess with pigs, but that got interesting. Um, me being a New Jersey girl who was raised in the suburbs, I was like, yeah, we've been around you know, larger mammals, it'll be fine. Of course, I got smacked by a sheep into a wheelbarrow while trying to set a snare line on a fence. <laughs> so I am not great with large mammals and I need to work on that. <laughs> we also had our ones that got away. Pigeons like this pale bird that sort of became our white whales. And being the nature of white whales, they of course evaded us in the end. This bird was a very unusual plumage, co plumage color. She was a brown and white grizzle, which is incredibly rare. Um, I kept trying to trap her. She loved to run around on the edges of the bone app and would not allow capture. So she was my biggest one that got away. And then we had distractions and other craziness, another tale from Key West. <laughs> So this is the Caribbean subspecies of the common ground dove. And I found this bouncing around my trapping site in Key West, along with cave swallows and white crowned pigeons and curly tailed lizards. And this bird especially, I thought was really, really cool because I didn't know the subspecies existed. So I'm like, why does this common ground dove have an orange, have a, sorry, a yellow bill instead of a red bill? And my, my evolution, centered brain was like, what's going on? I must know. So I ended up following that bird, led me away from my trap and to a drunk guy in a bush. I think that's the fastest I've ever run was away from that guy. <laughs> so getting distracted and leaving my trap and coming back running like, ah, was definitely a detriment um, that I did not expect to being in a really cool place with really cool animals around. Now, of course, some things went marvelously right. I'm here. I'm talking to you guys. I'm engaging with the public about pigeons and evolution. And 
maybe that's not everybody's dream, but it's mine. <laughs> I made friends and not just the pigeon that I tamed that lives under a local bridge. I know I just dissed the city of Boston, but I met a lot of really cool people in Boston and everywhere. Traveling across the East Coast with my parents, catching pigeons in a minivan that has long since expelled its last exhaust fume. I just met people. Some of them might have tried to kill my mom or take me out for a drink, even though I'm 17, but most were fine. And I got to sit down and talk with people. And I met a lot of people, again, in parks and on the street and in museums. And some of these people I still keep in contact with and beg them to review my manuscript. The, the, the museum folk, not the random bystanders on the street. That would be weird. And from all of this running around, I kind of learned how to be a person better. Not be a better person, but be a person better. So fun fact, as you can probably guess by the black v-neck, I am a bit of a recluse who spends most of her time with the shutters drawn, reading my Kierkegaard like a good, angsty little teen. And as cliche as it might sound, getting out into the world, hitting the open road, going on a great big old American road trip, it made me better at in being a person, just, just, just being around people, talking to them. The story of the building's Roman, it's a fun little word, isn't it, is of an education. And that's, that's what happened to me on my trip. And not just my trip, but all of my, my data. And another thing I learned is I know pretty well how science works. And not just on the scientific method level. I know a little bit more about the insides of science, the inner gear workings, the ideas that propel it. Not quite sure what I'm going to do with all of this new shiny knowledge, but magpie brain says shiny, pick it up, put it in brain nest. So I must. And of course, I got to spend time with these derps. I just love pigeons. They're great. I got to, I've spent a lot of time with them and that has made me incredibly happy. So, um, questions, comments, concerns, if you wanna bash Immanuel Kant with me, um, please email me, don't be scared, I don't bite, usually, at smrackowski at gmail.com. All right, um, questions, oh, questions in the chat. Does anybody have any questions? If you have questions, please feel free to type them in the chat box or the Q&A. Um, there's a bar down at the bottom of your screen. You should be able to type any questions you have. Sarah, um, you just blew me away. That's amazing. I just love that you're a senior in high school and you're you're doing all this. Um, I'm thinking about my senior in high school self and, and, and nothing compares. Okay, great. We have a question here. Um, Question. Kristen Baller says, great presentation and research. Do you have plans to continue the research and or ever reattempt to get the permit to capture pigeons in Central Park? I would love to. Once I have more resources, more time, more money, the dream is to do a global study of, well, okay, not a global study, but just do all of the Americas, um, go from Reykjavik to Terra ter ter Terra del Fuego, studying the introduced pigeons and seeing how different are they from each other, how could they diverge from one another, that sort of stuff. It's something that I would love to continue in the future. I see yep. that there is a question in chat. Yep. How long do rock pigeons live in the wilds? This is incredibly variable. Um, pigeons in captivity have been known to live for quite a long time, but the average wildlife span is about seven years, I'd say. But pigeons have a very short generation time. They breed very quickly and um, very constantly. So that's why we have a lot of pigeons out there. Um, did you catch any, other than what you showed us in the slides, did you catch any other weird things in your nets? We caught a laughing gull by accident. <laughs> we caught a morning dove who, that, that morning dove actually went to the walk-in trap. And um, 
is taking it out. And mourning doves, one of their defense mechanisms is to lose feathers to try and make them more slippery and slick to predators. So as I was taking this scared little mourning dove out of the cage trap, it was losing feathers. I was like, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I don't want to hurt you. We got house sparrows, we got European starlings. I caught myself a few times, especially on the snare lines. <laughs> um, I caught my dad a couple times in the snare lines. But yeah, that is. Great. Um, somebody's asking, what is the big protuberance at the base of their bill? Are they decorative or functional? So we do not know what that is. Uh, that's called the sear. And we're not sure if it's decorative. All, most species of columbiform have it. The pigeons and doves, they have some sort of bill protuberance. It might aid in their sense of smell, since among birds, pigeons and doves have a much better sense of smell than a lot of other birds do. There's also been hypotheses that it has to do with their magnetic sense, um, which is how some people think pigeons are able to navigate as well as they do. Um, another thing that's interesting, rock pigeons is the older a bird gets, the larger the protuberance grows. So it could be a dominance or age display thing. We're really not sure. Um, Mark says, great job, Sarah. Do you think that rock doves have developed their adaptability due to the initial domestication event because they seem to cling close to human habitations? Like dogs and cats, that appears to be the key to their key to survival. Would truly wild rock doves be less successful at spreading, in your opinion? So what we've seen from wild rock doves that unfortunately most of them are, most of the subspecies are endemic to regions that have seen a lot of conflicts, they're difficult to study, but they have spread around into, they, they've spread quite well. We have 12 subspecies. One of them is endemic to one oasis in Egypt, which is stunning by itself, but I do believe that the domestication definitely helps these birds in their success, just being able to live around humans and just having that extra little push to be living in our cities and on our rooftops. That is certainly a way that they've gotten their success. Um, what makes pigeons different than other birds? Are they monogamous? So yes, pigeons, pigeons are monogamous. They Oh, I can just start spouting cool pigeon facts now. They, um, they are monogamous. A lot of the time they have been known to breed during the winter, um, which is absolutely ridiculous. Their chicks are very strange looking. They look like a deflated dodo bird is the best way I can describe them. Um, they're very thick, very fatty, and that helps them keep warm when their eggs are being, when they're hatched in cooler, cooler climates. Um, they're monogamous, pairs will um, mate up. We also see same-sex couples in pigeons, um, which is also pretty neat. We usually only see that in marine birds, like penguins and albatross. So studying the social effects of that in pigeons is another area that we could go into. Um, pigeons are just really cool. Other than the physical adaptability, they, um, what else can they do? They have that really cool homing instinct. They can find their way back to the roost from almost anywhere in the world. Pigeons are just really neat, guys. <laughs> um, what was the main reason that you chose rock pigeons over a different species of bird for your research? So the original bird that I was going to work with was actually not rock pigeons. I The original draft for this research was to be done on monk parakeets, which are another introduced species that has formed colonies across North America. The issue with that was there were legal issues with going out and catching these birds because a lot of the places where they nest, the residents of that area have become very, very protective of their feral parakeets. Also, a lot of their colonies have been rather recently introduced, so there wouldn't be quite as much time for um, any sort of genetic change to take place um, as for other invasive species that I could study introduction for, European starlings have become begun to become migratory. So studying individual populations of those is much harder. And house sparrows, oh, how do we talk? Well, what was the issue with house sparrows? I think it, it was between 
house sparrows, and rock pigeons. And because we just see so much more diversity in rock, within the species of rock pigeons than we do in house sparrows, I thought it would just be far, far more interesting to look at rock pigeons. And I also love rock pigeons. <laughs> Awesome. Um, Victoria says, amazing job, Sarah. What would be the most interesting, surprising morphological feature that you would someday hope to find in your future study of pigeons? Hmm. We did have in, in Boston, the place of weirdness, we had an escaped Birmingham roller that was doing its somersaulting in the air. So if we could see birds that had the genetic mutation for somersaulting, which is a thing that's known, and they were living in the wild as free living, free breeding birds. That would be very cool. Another thing that we could see or be localized color morphs, which we're working on. You don't see a lot of true brown pigeons. You see a lot of reddish brown pigeons. And we did have a thing in Key West where a lot of those pigeons did have the, that brown color morph um, that ended up being cut from the final study just due to time restrictions and the very physical nature of it. But that is definitely something that I would love to explore. And of course, I love fluffy pigeon legs. They're so cute. I, there's nothing better than little pigeon socks, keeping their little feet warm. Um, what non-pigeon birds are rock pigeons most closely related to evolutionarily? So that is a very good question. So we know that the, the pigeons, the columbiforms, um, they spread out, you have the rock pigeons that spread out into the wood pigeons and those types of birds. But once you leave the pigeon family tree, there are birds in Asia and Africa called the sand grouse that look a little bit like pigeons from far away, but are not pigeons. They're very strange little birds, very cute. I would highly recommend you check them out. Um, and then another bird very close to the pigeon, sort of on the opposite branch, you know, are, a group of Madagascan birds called the Neocytes, which in themselves are very, very diverse, like, well, like most Madagascan birds, but that's just another really cool bird lineage that needs to be studied more. All right, does anybody else have any more questions? That wraps up our Q&A. And if not, um, Sarah, a million thanks. You did an amazing job. Um, Thank you everybody for coming. Um, we were just delighted to be able to provide her with a audience um, for, her, for her talk, for her research. And um, I fully expect to see Sarah's name in some of our ornithological journals down the road. And I, I hope I'm around to see it. So um, if nobody has any other questions, um, Sarah, thank you very much. And oh, hold on a second, we have one more. Um, nope, everybody just saying thank you so much for coming. So. Um, Thank you guys very much. Uh, we hope to see y'all at a Georgia Bird Fest or one of our free webinars and events soon. And everybody have a great evening. Uh, we are recording this and we will be putting a recording on our YouTube channel, on our Georgia Audubon YouTube channel within the next day or so. So if anybody wants to watch it or share it, um, you can do so from there. So again, thank you all very much and have a wonderful evening.